Good evening and welcome to the curriculum subcommittee of the Brockton School Committee. Today, Tuesday, March 8th, um, our meeting is starting at 5.34 this evening. I'm going to do a roll call vote to establish a quorum. Um, Mr. Homer? Here. Ms. Mendez? Here. Mr. Rodriguez? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. And uh, I, I'm here, Joyce Asak. So I just want to make a couple of announcements. Um, Kathy Ehlers um, reached out to me. She just had a, a, you know, tending to a personal matter, so she's not able to make it this evening. And um, Mayor Sullivan had a scheduling conflict. He's at another meeting, but he will be joining us later on. Um, so I just want to let everyone know that. Um, let's see what we have here. So since we have a quorum, we're going to go on to agenda item number one, presentation of the new strategic plan draft. If the superintendent can um, take that over for me. Sure. So um, before we um, invite our guest, uh, Laurie Likas, who is a, a consultant from um, uh, Coaching for Success, um, comes on, she'll be with us on Zoom. So just to take you back um, in July of 2019, when I was appointed um, superintendent, um, a new, all new superintendents are supposed to um, draft a new strategic plan for the district, which is a, usually a three to five year um, district plan. It's a roadmap how to improve the district. Um, at the same time, the timing was actually pretty good um, because that, uh, that July we also received the district review that was done and um, which kind of gave us already the roadmap on how, how to improve the district. So as part of that district review, we entered into the MOU with the Department of Education uh, and part of that MOU is drafting a new strategic plan. Um, we decided on a five year strategic plan. We decided on a very inclusive process of drafting the new strategic plan. Um, so uh, we worked with, we've worked with Laurie Likas for almost two years. Uh, it's, it's obviously delayed because of COVID um, and also, um, you know, just a lot that goes into the strategic plan, keeping everybody, um, you know, up to date and informed. So you'll hear from Laurie, she'll do a presentation on the process. Um, I, I just want to stress that this is a draft. It has to be approved by the school committee. Um, and, you know, we'll, you'll look it over. Um, we'll come back to you again at another school committee meeting in April. So you'll have uh, this time, you know, obviously almost a month to um, look it over and give us feedback. Um, so Laurie's going to explain the process. She'll go over the plan. She's also, and I want to thank um, some of the members that helped us draft the plan. So we, and she'll explain the process. So we had a leadership team. We had a community planning team, which involved uh, the community. And that was teachers. That was, um, that was also um, parents, students. Uh, and then there was a leadership team, which was all the leaders in the district, uh, along with uh, Kim Gibson. So um, you'll see it was a lot of people involved. There's a lot in the plan. But again, this, you have to remember this is a five-year roadmap to approve in the district. So you'll see a lot in it. And this is not everything in it will never be done in year one, two, or three is just a lot. Um, and a lot of, you know, you hope the goal is to get everything done and improve within the five years, but you'll see how much is in it, and uh, that's why we got to continue to remind people this is a five-year process, and um, there's action plans, there's priorities that you have to put in place. So Lari has done this with other districts. She works closely with the Department of Education. Actually, the Department of Education, as part of the MOU, um, actually you know, paid Lari for her services to help us uh, most districts have to pay that fee on their own. So um, so she, I'll turn it over to her, and then obviously there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Is she here? Um, Tracy? Yes, I'm here. Can you all hear me? Yes. We can. Terrific. Okay. Um, wonderful. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, as, as Superintendent Thomas said, my name is Lori Likas. I'm, a, uh, I'm the consultant who's had the, the, the privilege of working with the Brockton community to develop the district plan. Delighted to be here with you all um, this afternoon to present it. Um, and um, and as, as Mike said, 
We're going to start with, um, I've got a, a, some slides for you. We're going to go through. I'll, I'll just um, give you a kind of big picture view of what the process entailed, um, uh, the numbers of, of, of uh, folks in Brockton who have uh, been participating in it. Um, and then, then what we're going to do is uh, pause for a few minutes and, um, and uh, we're really um, uh, fortunate um, this afternoon that we have a few members of the community planning team who have uh, taken, continued to take time out of their own lives and their own busy schedules to, to focus on this work. So they're, they're gonna be um, there with you to, to share some of their own reflections and tell you a little bit about the process from their perspective. Then we'll go over the plan, just kind of big picture and, um, and a little time at the end for um, a little you know, discussion, a, a Q&A, uh, and I have some some questions for you if if you, you if we um, have time at that point um, to engage in that discussion. I know we you have a, a busy agenda with another uh, with uh, with another presentation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we will go ahead and uh, get get started. Let's see here. Um, all righty, so, um, so we'll go ahead and, and um, begin. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of touch lightly on a, a few, a few um, points to just try to, um, I know that we, we uh, presented this, the process a bit um, when I joined you in, in May, I believe, of last year, but I thought just a, a quick refresh might be useful. So um, as the superintendent was saying, just a reminder. So the district plan, the model in Massachusetts is that every district is asked to have a district improvement plan, minimum of, of three year um, scope of work and focus. The, that plan is kind of the official roadmap for improvement. Um, it should really serve as the heart of coherence for district work, a, a way of bringing everyone together and all of the efforts together. And in Massachusetts, the model is that you create this multi-year um, improvement plan, and every year you select the the uh, the initiatives, certain projects and programs in that multi-year plan that you're going to implement. And every year you create a more de a more detailed um, uh, action plan for implementation. So what we're looking at now is the multi-year roadmap. And the next step in the process, once we, you know, you, you approve that work, the next step in the process is to select and prioritize um, the initiatives for implementation next year and create detailed implementation plans for those initiatives. Uh, the, the process we're using is called Planning for Success. It's a Massachusetts uh, process that I had the um, the privilege of designing and creating with the um, as a consultant to the D Department of Education through work with districts uh, across Massachusetts. Um, the, there are three phases to planning for success, uh, just to, to kind of you know give you a sense of how the work goes. Again, where we are um, and what we'll be looking at tonight is the phase one, creating the plan, and then of course to to for the plan to uh, drive coherence in your district, and you then align all of your systems to it and the action planning happens in phase three um, for implementation. Um, as Mike was, was uh, reminding everyone, the model that he, there are various ways you can do planning for success, and the model that Mike uh, selected for Brockton um, was a community-based uh, community model where the plan was, has been developed across two different teams um, doing the work of, of building that plan. So we did all of the work um, between the district leadership team and a, and a community planning team. And then, of course, there's been community input um, from across Brockton and support from uh, numerous educators across the district. Uh, so there was another team that working um, for the superintendent called the district design team that also um, participated in this work. Uh, we also created um, some root cause analysis teams of educators. When I refer to leadership team in this process, we're talking about um, a, a really large team uh, that um, the superintendent and the executive, um, the executive team identified 
the members. There were approximately 100 people who participated um, as members of the leadership team. So these were central office folks, school, school-based leaders, and departmental leaders and other team members. This team met seven times to, to, to work on developing this plan from April of last year through February of this year. The community planning team um, uh, uh, consist of, consisted of about 40 members. Uh, some of the folks who were on there, this is the really, really critical kind of mixed stakeholder group team. So we had students, we had parents and other caregivers, we had Brockton community partners, we had teachers, other, other staff members, administrators, and union leaders. The community planning team met five times. They started meeting in October of this year, and they met five times between October and February. And just as a refresh, like, why did the superintendent um, uh, select this approach? Well, here are some of the benefits of taking um, such an inclusive approach to the development of the district plan. Um, through through the, the working with folks who have such diverse perspectives and experiences with the district, it really does help us um, build a, a higher quality plan um, and um, that will strengthen um, effectiveness of the plan. It's also a, very much an opportunity to build relationships and trust through the planning process itself among stakeholders that's going to really support this work. Because I think as everyone knows, you can have a, um, a wonderful plan on paper, but if you don't have the, the, uh, the will um, and the relationships to really um, uh, enact that plan, uh, you're not going to be successful. And um, the shared leadership and participation in the creation of the plan really does help to build everyone's understanding, both in district and outside of district, um, folks' sense of ownership and advocacy. So those were some of the benefits that we were seeking through the way we designed the process and through the, the way we conducted the work. So let's take a look quickly at the, what went into building the plan just so you have a sense of our process. Uh, when, I, when I showed you that planning for success slide about the creation of the multi-year plan, um, I really think uh, so you can sort of think of it this way, that building the plan, you're really weaving together three different threads one is your analysis of where you are today and why. What, one is the, uh, the other is a, the building of the aspirations that you have for the future. And the third is like looking outside of the district at um, looking outside yourselves at uh, practices that are effective elsewhere. So researching effective practices. So we're gonna start in with just a, giving you a big picture of what went into analyzing Brockton's current context, that thread of the plan. So in, through this work, we're trying to essentially answer two different questions. Where is the district today? And why is the district where it is today? Over the course of the time that, that um, I've been working with, with everyone, um, we've held 12 sessions with teachers and school and district leaders to explore these questions. Through these sessions, we had hundreds of educators from all schools in the district participating in this analysis and doing this analysis themselves. Um, and we began by looking at, you know, analysis, analyzing district data. Uh, we created seven different teams. The um, executive members of the executive team were very, very um, hands-on in identifying who should be a content leader and a data leader for each team. So uh, we created this little kind of mini team structure where folks in Brockton were responsible for selecting data that we, that, that, that we should be looking at and facilitating sessions to do root cause analysis. In the creation of these teams, the executive team was paid a lot of attention to, uh, to ensuring that every one of these teams had both vertical um, representation. So we had uh, educators from elementary, middle and high that we had school representation across all of them, that we had membership that was diverse in terms of how long educators had been in Brockton, what their background was, what their perspective was. These teams met to conduct root cause analysis of key data points and trends that they identified. And in total, over 150 Brockton educators participated in these seven teams. 
here's a list of the team focus areas. So what this means is we had a team of educators, you know, um, and the team size ranged from sort of 20 to 30 people, each team, um, a team that was focused on ELA, one on math, et cetera. Uh, we also had uh, the uh, number eight there, middle school ELA and social studies. Um, what was really terrific about this process as well was that we had some uh, Brockton uh, leaders who stepped up and, and uh, once, they, once, once we had the uh, model in place for how to do this work, um, convened and led some of the work um, on their own. In addition to the quantitative data analysis work that these uh, teams were doing, teams of educators um, were doing in the district, we also did some qualitative analysis that really focused on district practices, how the district worked, how the leadership team worked together in order to um, make change. We did SWOT analysis that, um, analyses that focused on the district's current planning practices and culture. Um, we, did, we did a SWOT analysis with the leadership team. We did one with the district design team. Um, the district design team also did root cause analysis of some of the key district review findings. And then the leadership team in June of last year did a pandemic analysis where um, they had an opportunity to uh, focus on what, 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 uh, what changes to practice had occurred during the pandemic that they wanted to be sure to build on and maintain. And then of course we had the external reviews. Um, we had, as uh, Superintendent Thomas has always referred to, we had the, dis the, the district reviewed, we also, district review, we also had the tiered focus monitoring report. So all of these were sources um, for our analysis of where Brockton is right now as a district and why it is where it is. The second um, thread that we um, um, engaged in to build the plan was envisioning the future. It, it, the, with this thread of work, you're really focused on answering the question, what are our aspirations for students? What, what's the community's aspirations for students? Um, what, we, what we did, of the um, activity that we used um, to engage folks across Brockton in this work is something called Back to the Future. Those three questions there are the questions that people would engage with. So like basically you pretend that it's five years in the future and you ask people, what are, what are the Brockton public schools look like, sound like, and feel like today, right? So if you're, if you're seeing the vision that you want to see, what does that look like? Question two, looking back, what did it used to look like, which is actually when you describe the current day. And then the third question, how did Brockton, you know, get to the future state? How did it become what it is today? Very simple creative, a fun um, protocol um, that everyone um, is able to, that, that the people across the community were able to facilitate on their own. So um, I would sort of model this for folks and then everybody went forth and, and did it, uh, which was terrific. Uh, members of the Brockton community held sessions from September through January. Um, we had students of, you know, uh, primarily high school and middle school students participating, uh, uh, school and departmental staff members. Um, uh, almost every school in the district participated in terms of um, staff. We had uh, bilingual and parents and guardians participating, some, some school councils, the um, NAACP Education Committee, um, the Chamber of Commerce, the, the leadership team I referred to earlier, and the community planning team. So in total, there were 32 visioning ses sessions that were held by, held and led by members of the Brockton community. So here, you know, really um, fantastic um, work and effort by everyone involved, hundreds of people, probably actually thousands of people contributing their time and their voices to this work. So that's, that's the process. Um, and so now we're going to sort of turn to the plan itself. And this is where I thought um, uh, to, uh, we would kind of pause and have an opportunity before we look at the plan um, to hear from some of our uh, community planning team members 
um, about their, their experience. And they're going to be speaking to you about some of the different stakeholder groups that they, uh, that they represent and represented in this process. So, um, so I'm going to right now um, to, uh, turn this over to Jess Hodges um, with, 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 uh, with a big thanks. Um, Jess was the person who worked really closely with the superintendent to design the community planning team really critical how that team is constructed, what representation looks like, um, the balances of, balance of voices in that, in that group. So Jess was instrumental in designing that group and in working with me um, in, 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 uh, in all sorts of ways um, to, to support the, um, the facilitation and the, uh, to help kind of oversee and, and uh, um, the group and communicate with the group. So, um, so Jess, if you would like to um, go ahead and uh, introduce members of our team, and then I'll go ahead and put up the, we're going to hear from folks in this order, and they're going to be speaking to these questions. So Jess, I'll turn it over to you and the team. Thank you, Lori. So um, we're thrilled to have members of our stakeholder dream team here tonight. I'm going to first introduce a familiar face to the school committee, Ms. Ellen Erstemayan. She's a senior at Brockton High School. She's very involved here at Brockton High, and uh, she devoted what little time she has to volunteering with us. So she was one of six students on the community, um, which included five high school students and one middle school student. She was an effective leader on the team and was often tasked with note taking for her breakout group. So Ellen, come on up. Hello, thank you. So. Like she already mentioned, most of you know me as the student representative of the committee group, but today I'm here to represent a student group of the community planning team. So as an active community member, I was recommended to work with the team and represent my peers along with five other students, one from Pluff, Pluff Academy and five others from Brockton High School. So together with the team, we've worked to create a strate strategic plan that will better the school and our community. We started off with envisioning the future, thinking about the year 2026 and how it would look like if we solve the specific problems that we have now in 2022 or like we had in 2021. We had data collected to work with. For instance, we had feedback and opinions from the middle schools, the high school teachers, staff members, and most of the feedback were from either underclassmen or upperclassmen in AP classes. We read the data, made categories for the information, and discussed ideas and found possible solutions. I was very happy to see that the student voices were truly heard and represented. I found myself always asking my classmates for their opinions on school issues and thoughts on creative events, certain events, which then I brought to the meetings to share with others. There were also, also, it was really good to see representation from other groups of our community and to work with adults and show the student point of view of our school. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. Next up, I'd like to invite Sarah Hendrick um, to the podium. She is an Angelo school parent. Her son is in first grade at the Angelo. She's very involved in the community and has volunteered with a number of organizations that serve Brocktonians arriving from Haiti. She has also tutored young students in math, English, and science and is a big supporter of STEM initiatives. As a higher ed professional, she has helped many um, families navigate school and college settings. She was one of five parents on the community planning team, which included um, representation from every level and included our CPAC president, Mrs. Terry McIntosh. So Sarah, please come on up. Well, thank you. Good to see everyone um, in person. Uh, thank you, Jess. Uh, my name is Sarah Hendrick, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity and taking the time to hear about our work as members of um, the community planning team. So um, as mentioned, I am the proud parent of a first grader at the Angelo School, Go Gators. Um, and I have been a resident of Brockton for over 30 years. I am originally from Haiti. And um, really, uh, this was a really great experience. And um, I can't speak enough for the awesome representation of our students on the committee and all the other members um, of our group. 
I think um, one of the most uh, meaningful pieces was in fact the diversity of the voices on the committee. And I commend Superintendent Thomas for having chosen the, this particular um, model because it takes courage, I think, to really be inclusive and to hear just such a wide variety of voices, um, to hear the challenges, to hear the solutions, and to hear the critics as well. So I think that was a very courageous um, decision. Uh, the strategic plan seeks to address what members of the community voiced, and what we heard were the following. The need for rigorous, and supportive learning, the need for empathy and support of social emotional health and safety of our students, the need for uniformity of standards. And I know this is the curriculum committee, so I, I really wanted to stress that, the uniformity of strong curriculum across the schools in Brockton, the need for instruction that is curated and tailored to members of our community, our student population, and the need for assessment. We heard that there was a need for educator and staff development, and I know that is near and dear to all of us here um, present. The need for enhanced resource allocation with an eye toward equity, and equity being key, meaning again, across all the schools of our district and the need to welcome, not just invite feedback from families and community members, but to welcome it and to listen to it and to leverage it. So one of the things that stood out to me in terms of being involved with this committee was that everyone brought real aspirations to this, to this work. And it wasn't just to talk and hear about all the feedback we heard, but there was a willingness to really roll up the sleeves and um, move things forward. So in closing, to the members of this committee, um, this goes without saying, but I think it's worth putting a fine point. Every decision, every vote of this committee should always be made with the well-being of students in mind. Every vote, every deliberation you make here should be centered on the student experience and on those who educate and support them, our wonderful teachers, our wonderful staff. And in my view, though our charge as members of the strategic planning team was to draw a roadmap for the future direction of Brockton Public Schools, to me it was also about envisioning a brighter future for the city of Brockton. When we create the conditions for all of Brockton students to thrive and succeed in supportive learning environments and give educators and staff the resources and the tools they need to do their very best work every day, in the long run, it is our entire city that will thrive. So thank you again for your time, and thank you, Superintendent Thomas, again, to you, your team, Jess in particular, Lori, and all of my fellow committee members um, who are here and um, who hopefully will, will um, continue on the good work that we started. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Next up, I'd like to invite up Barbara Laura, a language acquisition coach for the Brockton Public Schools. Barbara also leads our district's bilingual pack and is a tremendous advocate and support system for our multilingual families. She's someone I have the pleasure of working with quite often. She is one of 22 BPS employees on the team. Please come on up. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. My name is Barbara Laura, and I, as Lori as just said, I am an English language acquisition coach for the Brockton Public Schools. I am also a Brockton resident. I'm a parent of a former BPS student, and I am a child of immigrants. I've worked for the Brockton, for the bilingual department for 19 years in various positions, 
which have allowed me to work closely with our bilingual families through the community. One of my responsibilities this year is to be the lead for the district's Bilingual Parent Advisory Committee, or the BPAC. My primary goal in the community planning team was to ensure that the voices of our English language learners and multilingual families were represented in the strategic plan. To assist, I, along with the help of our district's bilingual advocates, held two visioning exercises. The first was with the bilingual PAC leadership team, which consisted of five parents representing three community groups, Cape Verdean, Haitian, and Latino. The second was open to all bilingual families in the district, and it was facilitated primarily by the bilingual PAC parent leaders. Parents were able to submit feedback in their native languages. The information was then translated by the bilingual department document translators. In studying the feedback, we learned that the input of our bilingual families revolved primarily around how they can understand and participate in the existing systems of the Brockton Public Schools. One major recurring theme highlighted the need for improved communication. Parent suggestions included increased staff who speak their native language in the schools and across the district. Uh, and the second was for information to be consistently disseminated in their native language at the classroom, the school, and at the district level. Thank you for your time today, and thank you for continuing to create spaces for our bilingual voices to be heard. Thank you, Barbara. And last up, but certainly not least, we have Ms. Yvette Joyce. Yvette is an ELA, ELA teacher at Brockton High School. She has been with the district for 12 years, first as an L, at the elementary school level before moving on to the high school level. She came highly recommended to the team by the leadership of the BEA, and we were thrilled to have her. Come on up. Thank you so much. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. I feel so honored uh, that I was invited to uh, share my thoughts and, and uh, share in this experience. Uh, like Jess said, I've been working with the district uh, for about 12 years, and um, I'm very committed to Brockton. I graduated from Brockton High School in 1983. Go Boxers. Um, so I love this city. I spent about 20 years as a software engineer and um, it was really burning on my heart as I worked as a software engineer that I didn't see enough people uh, that looked like me and came from the city uh, working in these high level jobs that I was in. And um, I said, what can I do about that? And that's when it was really on my heart to really come back to the city that raised me and, and made me successful and um, bring more people to where I, I, um, I got. Um, so it really meant a lot to me to be on this team, uh, to be able to further that goal and not just be, al not alone in the battle, but um, with this team, with this um, planning team uh, and the diversity on the team uh, with students and parents and just, I felt like it was a, a wonderful experience being immersed in the Brockton community again and really going, fighting for the same thing. Um, at the children, uh, our children's future. Um, one of the reasons I think also, or some, some other parts of my background is I've been working with DESI uh, quite a bit in recruitment and just working on other ways to increase the diversity of the staff uh, at all levels. I've been working with the curriculum committee uh, with the district trying to just find out what it is uh, will meet this student's needs. And I've been doing that at the high school level, the elementary level, and, um, and it's, it's been great doing a lot of research, takes a lot of time, um, but really listening uh, to the students, listening to the parents, what do they need, what do they want, and where do they feel like we can, we can do better with the curriculum. Uh, one of the things uh, I know uh, Ellen mentioned uh, just how much it meant to her working with the students in this process and hearing their voices. Uh, that was another thing that I was able to do was bring the community visioning to my students. I work uh, with freshmen and upperclassmen and just 
getting to hear from them the fact that they want to see more school spirit, that they want a stronger school community, uh, that they want the resources as well, um, but just seeing that they also want to be part of the, the future, right? They're not just showing up to, um, to pass the classes and get through this. They really want it. And it was, it was very refreshing to see that after the pandemic and looking at you know, students in boxes for basically two years, seeing them just want their education and want to be involved in the future was amazing. Um, so I guess in closing, um, I would say definitely, uh, again, thank you so much for this time. Um, what I really hope we take away from this is just to be able to prioritize the things that we can do to really let these visions sort of explode uh, and let the children uh, I don't want to get choked up um, reach their full potential. I feel like it's really on to it's really up to us to really let the vision for these kids. Um, make it a reality, they deserve that from us. And I know personally I'm very committed to it, but there's only so much I can do alone. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can do as a community to really uh, bring these kids uh, to, to, lead, to be our future leaders. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, uh, Jess, Ellen, Sarah, Barbara, and Yvette. For, um, for joining us for those reflections, those thoughts, and, and, uh, and that uh, uh, providing the, the, um, the committee with more, more information about what the experience was like and, um, and, and, uh, and just how hands-on the work was. Um, so I really appreciate that. And, um, and, I, and, uh, and I will say to the committee, you can see just from the, what you've heard in the last few minutes from these four, four people, um, uh, just a small, uh, small glimpse into the the um, the quality and the kind of conversation and the kind of work that um, that has gone on with that team um, in creating this plan. So thank you so much. So to come back to our PowerPoint, now we're just going to take a look. I, I know we're um, I'll be mindful of our time here, but but um, and I know that the members of the subcommittee have a copy of the plan. Uh, but I thought we would just take a, a look um, at uh, some of the, you know, the key elements um, of the plan uh, as they stand uh, today. So um, one of the um, components that the, that, the, uh, that the community planning team and the leadership team, um, you know, the plan was developed and in, in, uh, in kind of uh, uh, written kind of going back and forth from one, one team to the other. Um, so this is the, the vision statement. Um, that, um, that folks created um, for the Brockton Public Schools. And I will just uh, um, let you take a minute to, to read this. Um, there, there are, you're going to see a several of, um, there are several things here that you're going to be seeing as through lines um, in, the, in the plan. Um, and all of the elements of the, of the plan. Um, very uh, clear emphasis on um, equitable ac access on culturally responsive instruction, um, honoring honoring um, uh, and celebrating the diversity of the community, um, and the kind of safe, respectful, and inclusive um, and collaborative learning environment. These are the core values that, um, as they currently stand, uh, created again by the two teams. Um, what you'll see here too is the, the folks were, were careful to connect the core values. The core values and the vision were two of the last elements that we created in the planning process. Um, because at, this, at that point, at, when you work on these foundational pieces at the end, after you've really identified all of the work that, that you want to do, um, what it is that, that you want to achieve um, um, for students in terms of their experience and their outcome, and, outcomes, it's, it's actually a, um, much simpler to kind of pull from that, you know, well, what are the core values that we need to be need to be in place, we need to be mindful of and driven by in order to achieve um, these outcomes um, for students. So um, this is the, the set of core values here. And folks were also very careful, especially with that first 
one, establish an equitable, diverse, inclusive, and unified district. Very careful to tie that back to the um, the district uh, logo and some of the, the the work that has been done recently. And then um, through this, through all of the work um, that we did, um, the uh, um, the members of the community planning team and the leadership team um, actually, you know, read all of the there was uh, written written documents right um, from all of these um, uh, thirty odd. Uh, visioning sessions and um, and our sessions were working sessions uh, completely hands-on uh, folks in small groups read um, absolutely everything that the com that uh, that all those who participated had to say about what they wanted to see um, in the district and so from all of this work the um, teams identified five strategic objectives these are the big overarching goals for the district, there are five of them. Um, high quality learning experiences, access to learning opportunities, welcoming an inclusive environment, family and community partnerships, and equitable resources. So those were the five big overarching goals, the strategic objectives of the plan. Um, these, this slide shows you as, as, um, you know, as, as the plan itself does, of course, um, the full statement of, of, for each of these strategic objectives. Um, so you see here, it's, you know, uh, the objective about high quality learning experiences is, is the full statement is provide student centered learning founded on lived experience through high quality instruction that elicits excitement and engagement from students, families, and staff, so all are prepared to thrive as members of the BPS community and, and beyond. All right, so that's just one example. I, I can give you a minute to look at, um, at the language for the other ones. So the, the strategic objectives, these full statements, um, are, are communicating both what the district wants to accomplish and also provides a sense of why the district wants to accomplish that. So five big strategic objectives. Um, here are, for each of the, um, if the strategic objective is kind of the big statement of the, the, the what and the why, um, and then for every strategic objective, there's a set of strategic initiatives. Those, that's the how, right? So for each objective, um, and the initiatives here are 1.1 through 1.6, each one of those five objectives has a set of strategic initiatives, um, which is, is where, you know, again, everyone worked hard <laughs> and worked together um, to articulate how the district was going to be working with the community, with students to, to, to accomplish this plan to achieve that objective. So for um, student-centered learning um, with high, high quality instruction that elicits, elicits excitement and engagement, um, there are six strategic initiatives identified. Um, with 1.1, 1, 1 .1, um, the focus there is around work to create a, um, a culturally responsive, inclusive, rigorous, and engaging PK-12 uh, curriculum. So that is 1.1. Uh, Initiative 1.2 is focused on culturally responsive, high-quality instruction. And you can see there it spells out that fosters student independence and stamina. Um, so, so, so you get um, very clear um, statements of, of, um, of the work that is to happen for each of these initiatives. Initiative 1.3, providing academic and social emotional interventions. Uh, 1.4, um, expanding the use of common assessments and data. 1.5, implementing a professional development system, and 1.6, 
and this in some ways is um, is one of the the all of these are critical. Um, but given some of the the many conversations um, in the in the in the from the community, so critical establishing a pervasive growth mindset in all areas of learning, academic and social emotional, that's focusing on as student assets, setting high expectations and creating a more inclusive BPS. So those are the six strategic initiatives um, over the next five years um, that the district is, is hoping to accomplish in order to provide those student-centered learning um, experiences. For um, strategic uh, objective number two, enhancing all students' access to learning opportunities, there are four strategic initiatives here. The first one, expanding the inclusion of students with disabilities. The second one, redesigning instruction for English learners. The third one, redesigning the talented and gifted program. And the fourth one, widening the pathway to advanced placement. So these were the four areas where um, the teams and the community, um, school leaders, teachers were recognizing these are the four areas where um, students currently do, do not have uh, equitable access to learning, these learning opportunities uh, here and, um, and work needs to be done. For strategic objective number three, uh, about the, the creating and maintaining a safe, supportive, and welcoming um, inclusive environment of positive relationships, um, there are five. The first one is around um, creating a, a system that proactively supports social emotional wellness of students and staff. Uh, 3.2 is uh, focused on providing prompt, culturally responsive, multilingual communication to all stakeholders. 3.3, um, recruiting and hiring and retaining diverse staff. Uh, 3.4, providing students, families, and staff with opportunities to share feedback about their experiences with BPS. And 3.5, providing opportunities for student leadership agency and voice, so students are genuine stakeholders in decision-making. So these five initiatives together um, are what the, uh, what the teams wanted to commit to in terms of creating um, that supportive, welcoming, and inclusive environment. For objective four, the one um, focused on strengthening um, family and community business and higher educational partnerships to expand opportunities for students. There are three. The first one is focused on relationships with local higher learning institutes um, uh, for around you know, dual enrollment. The second one is creating business and vocational partnerships to develop um, apprentice and other kinds of um, programs to support student interests and provide additional career pathways. And the third one, collaborating with community organizations and families to provide enrichment programming for students and families. So those are the three for a strategic objective four. And for our fifth one, focused on ensuring equitable access to resources um, across the district um, there are three. The first one, working with stakeholders to develop criteria and a system to ensure equitable distribution of resources. The second one, um, ensuring all of the school facilities are maintained to provide a positive learning environment. And the third one, developing and ma maintaining a clear comprehensive budget document. So those are the um, that's the that's the meat of the plan, right? The the the, the big overarching goals, um, the strategic initiatives, um, the the different commitments that to, that this district would be making um, to achieving each one of these um, objectives. 
since the leadership team, the large the large leadership team could not be here with us tonight um, to to share um, to to share some of their experience. Um, I thought that you might appreciate seeing this feedback from the leadership team. Um, and in the, in our final meeting as a leadership team, one of the one of the um, activities that the team engaged in was a a plan review. And the question this question was. In what ways does the plan reflect an ambitious vision for the district? Uh, and I thought you might enjoy seeing some of these responses from, from, from members of the team. Um, that first one is uh, terrific. Go big or go home. Uh, success for all students. It's an overhaul of the school district. Um, uh, focus on equity and inclusion for students and families in the community. A collective responsibility for all of the initiatives as a district. And, um, and everything connecting to student growth and outcomes. So that was some of the feedback. That's, those are some of the leadership team's reflections on how they see this, this, this plan as being an ambitious one for the district. The next step in the planning process itself, the plan draft you, that uh, we just took a, 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 a look at and that you have, um, has all of the components of the district plan save one. And that's the outcome measures. Now, the outcomes are really a critical part of the plan. Um, it's, it's the expected results, what they'll be, how they're going to be measured, when they're going to occur. Um, and, and, um, and, and this is an example of, of what outcome um, measures, once fully developed, can look like. This is from the Cambridge Public Schools District Plan. So you can see here. Um, outcome measures are very, they're very specific. Um, they include specific, um, uh, uh, specific uh, data collection instruments and specific time frames. Um, you can see here um, the Cambridge Public Schools set uh, outcome measures for itself around um, third grade ELA, eighth grade math. Um, they, they, that district has one around um, increasing specific percentages of teachers of color. Um, and um, students' meaningful connections to adults by, by using data from um, the middle school health survey. So I just wanted to share that with you quickly to give you a, um, a, a little view into what outcome measures will look like um, once, once they're um, developed. And, um, and I, I think now I'm going to turn, turn it over to um, Superintendent Thomas to, to talk a little bit about that um, outcome development process. So um, once the plan is finalized and voted on by the committee, um, we will uh, work with the Department of Education, our partner at the Department of Education, our main liaison is uh, Susan Berglund. So um, we'll work with her, uh, the executive team members. Um, we'll work with Susan on what outcome measures that the department's looking for as part of our MOU uh, to make sure first they're realistic um, and um, they make sense. So that would be the next step after the, 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 uh, the plan is approved. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. So with that, I know that I'm, a, I'm kind of at my, um, uh, um, I, I, believe, um, I believe, Mike, we're, we're near the yep. end of my time. Um, so uh, we had put together a couple of, um, of questions, um, uh, I don't know if you for 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 discussion, um, um, Mike. Maybe I'll turn it back to you and see how you'd like to hand it, so, uh, handle. Yeah. Thank you, Laurie. Um, so first, I want to thank Laurie. I want to thank Jess, and I want to thank the members that came out tonight to, um, you know, really. In, first of all, I want to thank you for what you put into this. Um, you did this during a pandemic. Um, and your time commitment and um, your passion for this work is really moving, and I really appreciate um, what you did and how you participated. It was really important to me and the district to make sure this was a very inclusive process because uh, everybody has to have a voice, all our stakeholders. Um, but the time and effort, not only, you know, you put in, and then the members of the community, the other members of the community team, and the leadership team. So. I really appreciate the hard work you put in, and thank you for being here tonight. And you could just hear the passion you had for this work in your presentations, and uh, again, it's much appreciated. Um, 
and Jess and Laurie, I mean, I know it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents and papers and feedback that you worked with, you know, um, putting things together to come up with this document. So, again, thank you for all the hard work. So now the committee, um, as we move in, we, again, this will be voted on in April, so we have time. Um, you know, it just, you know, you have to take this, some questions to think about in what ways does this plan seem to be the right roadmap for Brockton, for us. It has to be owned by the Brockton Public Schools in the community. Is there anything missing, if anything? Um, and what strategic initiatives do you think are the highest priority for the district to focus on? So like this year, uh, obviously we didn't have a strategic plan. We we're in the middle of planning it, but you know, we needed to get a focus. We needed to bring a focus back to the district that was clear in our district review that we were pretty much too much all over the place um, uh, over the last several years. So we had to bring the focus back. So obviously we have our three focus areas and you see them here, the effective instruction, which leads everything. Um, we picked active reading and writing as our literacy initiative and then positive relationships. So um, these things will never, I mean, that's always going to be in a strategic plan, whether it's year one, year five, or year 10. Um, so that's what we obviously is our focus this year. Um, and as this is a five year plan, we'll be planning on action plans going forward. So those are the things for you to, to keep in mind. Um, and I'm glad that, um, and I'll go quickly because I know we've got to get to the next presentation, but if you can see in this plan that even though um, it's not finalized yet, but if you can see what you're going to hear tonight, um, how much work we've been doing already towards things in this plan. Um, um, an example, what we talked about having more students of color more student English language learners and all our students having more access to higher level classes. That's why last week you approved the new middle years program, honors program. Uh, tonight you'll see uh, a presentation um, by myself, Dr. Zakowitz and Kelly Jones around uh, how we're gonna um, restructure the bilingual department so we can make our English language learners more successful and close their achievement gap. Uh, and then you'll see later in a finance meeting and uh, I wanna thank um, the members uh, of the community uh, leadership team for bringing this up, you'll see the commitment in that ESSER 3, which is finance, um, towards curriculum, really giving our teachers the tools necessary um, to be successful and our students to be successful. Uh, so you'll see an ESSER 3 plan that really puts a lot into curriculum, which is well overdue. Uh, and, not, and curriculum that's curated, um, vetted, um, piloted, and making sure that it fits, it's free of bias, um, and it's much needed at, at all levels of, of this. We have some new curriculum now that we've put in, uh, but you'll see tonight in the SA3 plan. So again, I, a lot of the things you see here, uh, are stuff that we've already put in place, things that you've voted on to approve already. So uh, I'm excited about um, the direction we're going and how much work has been done so far towards what you see in the strategic plan. Thank you. Um, any of the committee members have any questions or comments? I, I just wanted to make one comment is, um, thank you, Superintendent. Um, between you and the leadership team, this is a wonderful pres rep presentation and um, it is only a draft, but it looks like you covered a lot of the areas that were um, brought up in the district review. And, um, you know, and, and again, thank you to those that, that presented this evening. Um, you can see the passion, you know, and that's the one thing about Brockton is we do have the passion and we want to be there to help our students and give our students that extra voice to help them and give them the tools and give our teachers the tools that they need for us to, um, give them the best education we can. So thank you, we appreciate that. I know we're running a little um, short on time. If any of the members have any questions or comments? Okay, it doesn't look like anyone's got any, um, I think we're all set with that one. Thank Laurie, you so much, thank Laurie. you so much for being with us tonight. A and thanks to our members of the community team. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you, thanks very much. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to present and to be here with, with uh, the members of the team and, uh, and really appreciate your time. And, uh, 
and uh, and absolutely just to follow up just really quickly on that on the the, the one comment absolutely um, part of my role is to cross check and triangulate so um, indeed this plan includes what it needs to um, in terms of the district review the important thing is that the community itself um, acknowledged and and uh, voiced so many of the um, same conclusions as the Department of Education observed. So um, that's a very powerful part of the process. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and wish you well with the rest of your, your um, presentations tonight. Thank you, Lori. We appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening. You, thank you. So we are going to go on to agenda item number two, success for all Brockton's English learners. Um, I don't know. <laughs> We're just making sure we have the good clicker so we're not <laughs> Otherwise, we'll back and forth and back. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Um, so, oh, here we are. Good. <laughs> Kelly, we want to make sure Kelly Jones, uh, Director of Bilingual, is zoomed in. Can you hear me? Oh, there she is. Hello, we can see and hear you. Hello. Great. Nice. Thank you, Kelly, for being here. Um, so, um, it's important that, uh, to note the work that's been going on by the bilingual department um, in partnership with the Department of Education, uh, working with uh, Dr. Zakowitz and myself um, around in the bilingual staff, working around redesign, redesigning our bilingual department and uh, for our multi-language learners. Um, this is like a new era. We really, it was clear in the district review, it's clear with uh, our achievement gap that you know, we have to do better for English language learners, uh, for all students. So, um, you know, we started work this year on um, looking at, you know, where us kids are going to school, um, the numbers in the classes, why some students are spending too long in the bilingual department before they're, you know, before they're put into regular education classes. Um, and it was all about student achievement. So, so we basically want to redesign our bilingual model to ensure equity and inclusion for all students. So you heard that throughout the strategic plan. Uh, it's a goal for the, a huge goal for the system is about equity. Um, and this is all about equity. So it's the inclusion of all students. So, so we must meet the needs of change, the change in population in Brockton. So when I started, this is my 29th year. Um, so I started at East as a teacher. And at that time, East had um, the Cape Verdean population of any student that was in the bilingual uh, department that was, um, you know, that spoke Cape Verdean, they went to East. Um, and that was the only middle school that they went to. So obviously now, that's not the case. We have English language learners throughout the district. So um, we must change with the, you know, the, as Brockton has changed. So the city has become very, you know, increasingly diverse. It's changing rapidly. I mean, we are getting um, more English language learners every day, and we welcome them. Um, so we need to be flexible. Right now, we're kind of pigeonholed where, um, where we have to put students. That means we have to send students out of their neighborhood schools, certain strands. So I'll give this example. This happened about, in, the, in we're even more diverse now. So about, I don't think it was about eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, there was a, um, a car hit a bus, and it was over by the Huntington School, and it was an elementary bus, and it was a bus going to the Brookfield. And it was um, Cape Verdean students who were getting on a bus on the south side and pretty much going pretty much the whole brook <laughs> to go to school, which is you know how far out uh, Brookfield is. Um, and we're still doing that a lot, sending students out of their neighborhood schools into strands um, because that's where we had room, uh, that's where the teachers were, um, and that model cannot be, we just can't sustain that model anymore. It's, it's, um, it's not efficient, um, it hasn't been, you know, it, obviously the results, our students' results, it hasn't uh, been successful for them. Um, and again, it's taking students out of their neighborhood schools. So, you know, it just, it grouped them by language and it made us transport them all over the city. Um, so now you have obviously much more diversity throughout the entire city, uh, unlike we had years past. 
So we have to change. We have to meet the needs of our children, our, our English language learners, and our families. So what you're going to see tonight presented by Dr. Zakowitz and, and Kelly Jones, some really hard work that within to looking at the model, what changes we can make, um, working with the Blueprint Group, which is um, part of the Department of Education, um, and working with them as our partners with experts in uh, bilingual education. So I want to commend Dr. Zakowitz, Kelly Jones, and her team. Uh, Kim Gibson was involved as well. So I just want to thank them for all the work they put into this, and you'll really see um, how this is going to bring us and move us forward and uh, really make change and, and bring a lot more equity to, uh, to the school department. And um, Ooh, my, you're tall. <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, and I'm going to echo what what uh, the superintendent just said. This was really the work of Kelly and her team. It, this was, um, I, I will tell you, early on when I joined the rejoined the team here in Brockton, um, one of the first visits that Mike and I got was from the Parent Information Center. Marcia um, Serpa Andrade came in and said, um, "We can't sustain this. She's trying to place kids and." They're all over the place. And Kelly and her team just um, got to work. And it, it's really, I think you'll be pleased. It's, it's really good work that's been done. Um, and it was interesting to hear the strategic plan. This is, it, it, the timing couldn't be better. I mean, this is one of the goals. It's one of the, it's already in process. And Kelly couldn't be here tonight. I'll let her explain that in a minute. But she's with us here. And, um, and so uh, much of this will be done by Kelly. But let me just give you a quick overview um, this is tied directly to the work of this district, and it started with the district review, which has said clearly the review showed that more effective academic support systems were still needed, especially for ELs and students with disabilities, particularly related to their inclusion in general education settings. That's what this is about. That's what the middle school honors academies are about. It is about all means all in Brockton, and I know you all stand for that. Um, but it isn't just the district review. We also, because we are under the watch of, the, of DESE, um, and, well, it, they, DESE does this anyway. It's about, they, they do monitoring of the districts as they should. And in a recent tier, see how recent this is in 2022, we just went through a tiered focus monitoring. And Kelly and her team and Mike and myself and Sharon Wolder were all on this, um, in this monitoring report. And, uh, and one of the things that was stated clearly is while the um, EL programs may require that EL students receive separate instruction for a limited period of time and self-contained newcomer programs can be designed as a bridge to integrated SEI classrooms. ELs in the district stay in self-contained SEI classes for many years and sometimes as long as five to six years before they meet the district's exit criteria of overall access score. 3.2 and literacy score 2.9 and transition to integrated SEI classes. You know what? That makes us look in the mirror. We have to say, why are the kids staying too long in the programs and how do we address that? And that, that's what this is about. So let me, when Mike mentioned how the city has changed and he said he's been here 29 years, such a baby. I, you know, I retired at 40 years and then, and then returned and so grew up here like Mike did and like so many of you did. And so the city is a very different place when I grew up as a kid, and, um, and it's on us to change, right? It's about the adults. So um, think about who are our kids, who are our students now. And Kelly said the word to use now is not bilingual. The word to use is multilingual. And, and when you think about who our kids are now in Brockton, it is a very different place, like Mike was saying. So 44.7% of students in the district are first language, not English. Um, that represents 37 languages, 31 countries of origin, um, and 4,318 English learners are in our district right now. Um, 1,090 are former English learners, uh, 550 English learners with IEPs, and then uh, this is an amazing statistic to me. This is how fast the city is changing. 1,180 are in their first two years of schooling in, in uh, here. Um, so they're in their first two years of, in the United States. So a quarter of our students are in their first two years of their schooling in the United States that are here in Brockton. And so um, when you think of this, look at this number. 
695 English learners, grades 1 to 12, have arrived since September, which is one of the reasons why Masia came in and said, we cannot sustain this. So this was, I'm going to turn this to Kelly, and, and, uh, and she and I will, will go back and forth if need be and, and just share with you the strategy. Now, we're not going to get into the deep details of, uh, you know, of exactly the, the, the systems that we're using to make this happen. We hope that by the end of this, you really get a good understanding of the shift in the design of this program to meet the needs of Brockton's kids. So let me turn it to, to Kelly to take on, uh, you know, who are our kids and what do the demographics show? And it's fascinating what the city is now. Thank you, um, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be there. As you can hear, I'm a little under the weather. So I'm going to try to do my best from a, a, a remote location. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit about how the demographics have changed only in the last five years or so. We've gone from 3,502 English learners in January 2016 to 4,318 in February of this year. Um, our numbers of former English learners and have increased as well as first language, not English. And so when we talk about first language, not English, I just want to say that group encompasses elves, former English learners, students who, who have exited a long time ago, English learner status, and those who were um, tested but did not qualify for English learner services. So we have a wonderfully diverse community here in Brockton. If you look at our, our languages, um, I highlighted in, in red the two languages that we're seeing dramatic increases since 2016 to today, and that's our Spanish population has almost doubled in size. And we're seeing a large uh, community of Spanish speakers residing in Brockton in the last six to eight months, as well as Portuguese speakers. You can see that Portuguese has more than dub doubled as well. And those are primarily coming from Brazil. Our, our Brazilian population is dr increasing dramatically. And on the right-hand side, you can see the amazing languages that we have of our current English learners in the district, all the way from Arabic to Yoruba. <laughs> so I, I chose, I, I took this information from February of this year, and I wanted just to highlight where are our English learners right now. The majority of our English language learners are actually in our integrated sheltered English immersion program. Because what happens is every year, Students exit our self-contained programs into our, into our integrated programs, and our integrated program students exit English learner status. So, so every year, there's a cycle of students exiting English learner status and a shift in the programs that they are in. So 45.7% of our students are in ISEI, 34.4% are in, in our SCI, we do have transitional bilingual education offerings at the secondary level, as well as our dual language program offerings, our Juntos Two-Way programs, our Unidos Portuguese Immersion program, and our Amitié. And, and to highlight a little bit about the, um, the, the two-way programs, those numbers are actually, are actually fairly low because in those programs, students exit English learner status fairly quickly. So 3.6%, that does not include all of the kids who have exited English learner status in our Juntos program. <clears throat> so based on the DESI recommendations, um, we convened a Brockton Blueprint for English Learner Success team. Um, DESI has a, a, a blueprint, a vision for English learner achievement in in the state, and they have a blueprint on how to achieve that vision. And in that blueprint, there are four pillars. The pillars are school culture, access to educators, opportunity and support, and a plan for, for future success. So the district, with the support of TLC, convened a group to learn about the blueprint, do a self-analysis, we identified our strengths and identified high leverage areas for improvement. We reviewed and analyzed data and evidence, 
And then we start thinking of like, how can we start to plan for improvements for English learners? And we wanted to be part of the larger coherent strategic vision and plan. And you can see that this work is really part of 2.2 of the strategic plan. And we reported to uh, the superintendent and the deputy superintendent periodically so to ensure that we were part of something um, larger than just our small team. So the, the, the group identified three high leverage areas. One was to develop a shared district vision that incorporates English learners' success and guides systemic efforts to operationalize that shared vision and responsibility um, and accountability for English learners to ensure that the, the vision becomes a reality and then align structures, resources, and supports to ensure that that is successful. So we're developing a vision, we're going to operationalize that, in the, that vision, and then we're going to align resources to ensure that vision is placed. And one of the ways that we um, are, can do this is through um, the next slide. So we would like to um, talk to you today about the launch program. This is an elementary program, and the design of it is to launch the academic success of English as a new language student. These are the students who do not have um, uh, multilingual um, homes, do not live in a multilingual world, but English is really a new language for them. So what is the launch program? Um, it is our response to develop shared responsibility and equitable access, and it's a reimagining of self-contained SDI. What we are envisioning is a multilingual, multilingual language strands for students in those earliest proficiency levels, levels one and two, in each zone. So students can stay in their zone in, um, and have responsive and flexible student integration. So instead of having to go to a brand new school when they, um, when they are integrated into ISDI, um, they can stay in that school. And those are the schools that um, are, are in the zones um, and that students would be able to um, participate in the launch program. And before Kelly goes on, I'll, I'll add to Kelly and her team and all of us actually worked with Desi on this. Like they had, one of the things they've done is the partnership that Mike had set up was provide support to us in thinking this out. And this was new to us. So um, we asked for help. Like, you know, we shouldn't be trying to reinvent things if there are models that are out there. And one of the, um, ed one of the people that they help that they assigned to us really helped us tremendously talking about she had actually worked in Lawrence and um, and now works with Desi and provide us really great expertise so it wasn't just all of us sitting together it was with the support of others who had done similar things and I want to give a huge shout out to Kelly and her team though for we kept playing around with you know some a program like this needs some kind of identity and we newcomers it just didn't seem and it, it just wasn't a good name. It wasn't. It just didn't have a good feel. And and Kelly came into Mike and I one day, and she said, "I have an idea. It's like we're launching these kids into success. Let's let's make it our own. It's a launch program." And I think it's it exactly says what we're hoping happens. So thanks, Sue. Um, so what is needed to make the launch program successful? This is a shift in kind of how we, how we operate, and there needs to be professional development for leaders, for educators, for coaches, for paraprofessionals to support a shared vision and shared responsibility and the instructional needs of English learners. Um, we're, we need English language acquisition coach in each of the elementary schools to support teachers and students in meeting the needs of those, those English learners. Um, we're going to need additional paraprofessionals in, in major languages to support students and families. This is because no longer are the, the, the language resources going to be really targeted at a particular school. If, if the multilingual strands are available, are, are in all schools, we're going to need um, multilingual paraprofessionals to support the kids and their families in having access. 
and then additional community relations facilitators to, sp to support the homeschool connection and promote educational access. And while the, 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 um, the launch program really addresses 2.2 in the strategic plan, I'd like to just say that all this professional development, the coaches, the paraprofessionals, and the community relations facilitators really address 1.2, 1.5, 1.6, and 3.2 in the strategic plan. So it's, it's, it's supporting the greater strategic plan of the district. Well, and that's well said, Kelly, because it does get to the issue of access equitable access and just like we said to you for the middle school honors academy instead of taking kids and saying oh no the program's over here you have to go over here to get it what we're saying instead the shift is no we're delivering the services the kids need to where they are that's a big mindset shift and and it's one that's that is totally supported just the way kelly said it, it's all over the strategic plan as it should be it's who this city is So what does this transition to the launch program look like? Um, TLC, which is the architect of the, um, the blueprint for English learner success for the state, will be working with the district this spring and summer to plan the structures and supports for the implementation year of 2022-2023. Really importantly, parents are going to be given a choice to stay in their current school or attend a neighborhood school. So previously, when children are integrated, they have to switch schools. And so um, there is a lot of anxiety about integration. But when we have, um, we, we are making a pledge to families that you get to stay in your school if you want, or you can go to your neighborhood school if you want. And then we're going to allocate some resources to um, have a launch academy. To, help, um, to be held for students who will be attending the launch program in 2022 and 2023, and that will be grant funded. The, the next one, Sue? <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> so what are the benefits of the launch program? So because the, these are your kids for your entire school, uh, your entire career in the school, it does promote a shared vision and shared responsibility for English learners in the school. We saw already that the, the majority of English learners are in the ISEI program. So what we want to do is we want to promote shared responsibility. We are all teachers of English learners, and these are all our students. We're going to be able to target instruction for students at those earliest proficiency levels, those level ones and twos. It promotes a flexible range of programming for English learners responsive to their English language development progress. So because they were, there was a transition into a different school when they're integrated, integration only took place once a year. But language acquisition doesn't take place once a year. Language acquisition can happen, it does happen throughout the school year. And when a child is ready for integration, that child should have access to integration. And being able to stay in their school and be, be a part of that community promotes that flexible range of pro, uh, programming. But it still maintains choices for families about their education of their children. And one of the things that we really pride ourselves in Brockton is the choices that families have to make decisions that's best for them. So this maintains choices for families. And over time, I do believe it's going to decrease transportation costs because students will not necessarily be bused all over the, uh, over the city. They'll be staying within their zone. And you can imagine when, um, when Kelly was um, sharing this with us, some of the reticence of some of the kids to leave the SEI program is because they had to change schools. So a picture of a kid who's nine years old, and we're saying, good for you. You've now, you're ready to, to move into a, a general classroom, and they're like, I don't want to leave. I, they, they've now known that school for a couple of years. And so this way, as Kelly said, um, they'll be in their neighborhood school. It's a, it's a different atmosphere. As she said, you can, the kid, is when they're ready, language acquisition happens for them. And so it is, again, based on the student needs not the district structures. 
So I, that I, is, you know, we tried to give you an overview of the change. It's really a, a dramatically different mindset, I think. Um, and it really does follow um, your commitment as a school committee for all means all in Brockton and how we deliver the services to kids. And we come to them where we meet them at where their needs are as opposed to, um, you know, saying, and that's, by the way, been the Honors Academy for this. It's about let's bring what they need to where they are. So it's, it's meeting the kids where they are and the families where they are. So, um, you know, we'll, we're happy to take any questions. As I said, there's much, the, of course, the devil is always in the details. And that's something that Kelly and her team have laid out. We didn't provide all of that for this level of um, a presentation, but all of that will be a very detailed way. Where do we need the teachers? What trainings do we need? All of that is all in Kelly's broader plan. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Zakowicz. Sorry. Um, anyone have any questions? Just one. Mr. Sullivan? If, thank you, Dr. Zach. A great presentation. On that launch academy, where, are you planning on doing that in the summertime? Or, or, There'll be or, a, they will be a summer component to help get ready for this, but this, the launch happens whenever kids get here. They're launched into learning English and being part of the program. So it's not a one-time entrance. It's whenever the kids are there. Oh, I see. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with any questions or comments? Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, everyone, for you know, a nice presentation. I was one of those bilingual students that was getting bused. On a bus? Um, to the Gilmore School at the time. And the Anon School was right up the street where we could have just you know, walked up there. And then um, also, you know, when I look back at it now as an adult, um, like I was born here. I was born in the United States, but I was still placed in a bilingual program. You know, and I and I always question. I'm like, why? You know, we spoke English very well, and I'm like, why are we in this program? Mm -hmm. So I think you know, back then, you know, obviously, you know, changes that, you know, we got lost. There was a a, a large group of us that got lost in that, and that, and I'm I'm very happy that this is being restructured yeah. to the way it should be, and uh, and we can actually you know help these you know the bilingual, uh, multilingual, Multi um, right, multilingual, and, and uh, we appreciate. I mean, you lived it, so. I lived it. So, and, you know, to this day, and um, Mrs. Fonts, you know, was my first grade teacher. She's still teaching. <laughs> you know, so thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment. I'm complete opposite of Mr. Rodriguez. I wasn't born in this country, so English was not my first language. And I remember it was Mrs. Sullivan, Miss Sullivan, and then she, she got married. Miss, Mrs. Nak Nakimoto, I believe we went to her wedding, and um, she, I would meet with her on a regular basis at Brookfield and look, you know, to look at the numbers, 44.7%, almost 50% of our right. students are multilingual. Right. We need to invest. Yeah. We need to, um, and before we had our own busing, it was a financial strain on us to bus a lot of students from different schools. I mean, I would go to Brookfield, but I ended up going to Franklin. I could walk to Franklin, yeah. but they didn't have that at the time right. in the early 80s. Right. Um, <laughs> so we, I, I, you know, I'd go to Brookfield, I'd take the bus. And, and go to Brookfield, um, and I think I was only there for a year or two, and then I went back to Franklin. Yeah. So and how hard is that, changing when you're a little kid, changing schools? That's It's a that, lot, especially such to an keep them with the neighborhood schools. Right. And um, again, it's, it's going to help. They build different relationships right. when the students are in their neighborhood schools. That's right. Uh, they get to, you know, build relationships with other, other kids in their neighborhood rather than, you know, busing them all over the city. So this is wonderful. I'm glad that we're growing this um, and we're restructuring it. Yep. So you have two products right here. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure there's others, but this is, this is wonderful. I've, I'm always supporting the bilingual yeah. because that's, I went through it myself at the age of five. And um, so I'm, I'm a product of yep. BPS. So look at us now. <laughs> Both serving can on I, the school committee, Mr. Something? Rodriguez. <laughs> may, may I say something? Sure. You know, I'm really proud of Brockton because Brockton was the first uh, district in the state of Massachusetts to have bilingual education. That was 1973, uh, and we're coming up to our 50th anniversary of bilingual department in Brockton. And we have always been um, welcoming and responsive to uh, the needs of, of our, our communities. And so I'm really happy that we're able to to um, kind of 
um, respond and be responsive to the changing demographics of Brockton. Thank you. Um, anyone else with any comments? M Mrs. Mendez. I also want to add um, that just like hearing other people's feedback, um, just when it wasn't integrated the way that this vision is and this proposal, there was a lot of segregation among the subgroups that we have. So this is a great way to try to build, especially the social emotion of other kids and just like, you know, like Beverly Tanum says, you know, why are the black kids sitting in the table? You're always gonna be with people that identify and you wanna have that comfort space, but this is just a way to try and make the effort to have and relate to others versus from feedback that I've heard a lot is that it used to cause segregation, right? And we saw that a behavioral in the high school level um, when there were just you know well um, subgroups against each other. Yep. But what I did wanna ask um, is we're speaking a lot about rigor, which is amazing. I love s speaking about these things. But when we think about ELs and this integration, how do we envision students that are ready for honor programs yes. to be supported yeah. in honor programs? Yes, and that question is huge because there should be. The, I mean, your what was, I think one of the things we wanted to address with the Middle School Honors Academy, and, we'll, and we started with middle school, we're going to back it up, but um, to the elementary as well. Uh, because you don't have an English as a proficiency yet doesn't mean you're not a talented student. So that's what's so powerful about this, but you're absolutely right. There needs to be support at every step of the way. Mm -hmm. For the Honors Academy, we're going to include the uh, Honors Academy Advisory, which helps with that sort of thing. But I think it's also on us from the beginning in terms of recruitment. First of all, making kids understand that, oh, yes, you belong. Yes, you should be part of this. Because without the encouragement sometimes, somebody will not necessarily step forward. Oh, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I think it's on us to recruit kids, but also su to support them when they're in there. And Kelly mentioned already, there's a lot of details, again, that we didn't share. But part of this requires a lot of training and also um, the support for the kids in the classroom with coaching and with paraprofessionals as well. It can't be just, okay, we've re reassigned you to another school. It has to surround, the kid has to be surrounded with the support that they need. So you're absolutely right. If it's, if it's not supported, it's not going to work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank, thank you, Kelly. Kelly. Sue, thank you. <laughs> so item number three, other business. Do we have any other business? No, I think nothing we're for good. me. Uh, we are running a little um, late on time to start our um, finance. So can I get a motion to um, adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Uh, can I get a second? Second. So a motion's been made by Mr. Rodriguez, properly seconded by Mrs. Mendez. Um, all in favor? Motion, uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.